morning. I think uh, we are live. Uh, hello uh, to uh, our uh, guests and hello to the Romanian audience who is going to be surprised by the fact that this conversation is being um, is happening in English. It is happening in English because our uh, main guest is Jimal Kalili, who is a well-known physicist, uh, but also a science communicator. And he is uh, our guest here because uh, Humanitas is uh, launching his book, a book uh, that he has coordinated about extraterrestrial life. Uh, Jimal Kalili uh, is a professor of theoretical physics and he also holds the chair in science communication at the University of Surrey in UK. And uh, joining me to ask him questions about what he does and why he does it is Vasile Deku, a Romanian science journalist with a vast experience in talking to scientists. Hello, both of you. Hello, Hello Ada. And I apologize. My my Romanian is 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 too bad that I couldn't talk to you <laughs> in the right language. <laughs> That's okay. I think uh, English is second language for you too, uh, and uh, English is second language for a lot of Romanians because we uh, are quite good. Our uh, viewers, our readers, are quite good. Uh, in Romania, we don't dub. Uh, foreign programs so uh -huh. uh, at least the younger generation they are quite fluent in English so I hope they are going to be able to follow what we say. Good, good. So uh, let's uh, start this uh, uh, proceedings with asking you about the book that uh, is translated already and uh, it's available for the Romanian audience. It's about extraterrestrial life. Okay, and uh, it's called extraterrestrials, basically, in Romanian. And the question is, uh, what made you want to bring together all the scientists to address this issue? I, I, think, I think probably everybody knows if you Google extraterrestrial life on the internet, you find so much information. Most of it is, is, is not scientific. It's, it's you know, it's uh, conspiracy theories, it's beliefs, it's ideas and so on. And there's a lot of confusion. However, the, the, the possibility, the question of whether there is other life outside of our planet is probably one of the most important, fascinating questions in, in human existence. We need to know, are we alone or is there anybody else out there? And so I was invited to bring, as you say, bring together lots of experts who understand different aspects of the possibility of life elsewhere. So um, biologists, uh, um, astronomers, people who are studying how life began on Earth. So, so we can find out, is, is it, are we very special? Are we very unusual? Something normal. Um, but also psychologists, for example, you know, who study why do people believe, for example, they have seen uh, aliens visiting them or they, they, they believe what they see on YouTube, on the Internet? So it's, it's not a book about, yes, there is alien life out there. It's a book that's asking the question, is it possible that there could be life out there? And if it does exist, what, what will it look like? How do we know what it might look like? And what are the chances that we will, we will be able to discover it? So... It's, 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 a, it's a careful scientific analysis of this very popular question. It's a, it's a short book compared to other, let's say, 800 pages treaties about various scientific subjects. But it's impressive how much insight you get by reading it. You manage to get a lot of uh, contributors. Uh, which one or... Of course, I'm not asking you what are your favorites because <laughs> your friend, but which one surprised you the most? Um, probably the the uh, the scientists that have um, the expertise in chemistry uh, is is what's surprising because people always assume if you watch Hollywood movies, you know, if if the aliens exist, they look like us. 
certainly they will have the same structure of you know biology and biochemistry as 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 us and the chemists who have studied this understand the nature of the chemical elements so we talk about carbon being the base of of, of life so what is interesting is when a chemist says you know why is carbon so special maybe life could be built around some other element maybe silicon or something like that very fascinating to to learn about why the element carbon is exactly the the correct type of atom that can help create life because it can hold together lots of other elements oxygen and nitrogen and so on it can create complex structures so i i i found the the arguments from the chemistry side even before you know you think about the difference between biology and chemistry you know how does how on earth did chemistry become biology but just the basic chemistry i found very fascinating and indeed that is how we're probably looking for life um, elsewhere by looking for the chemical signals we're not going to look through our telescopes and see people saying hi we're aliens we're going to see chemical evidence that tells us maybe life exists somewhere else i i have a, a question i'm a Uh, chemistry major so my question comes from uh, a little bit of insight if we are starting to look for um, alien life based on carbon based and then we bring in water and then we bring in the drake equation about how the if we put all this constraint on the uh, the systems that we are looking for isn't that going to result in basically one planet one type of life form which is the one we have because so many constraints mm. probably don't allow for a lot of diversity at the end of the day is it the way we are looking at it or is it the way it is possible i think it's 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 the way it is you know if life exists elsewhere it's it makes sense to look at the most likely way it could form and you know you mentioned water for example you know this is why we 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 always talk about um goldilocks planets you know that they have they're the correct distance from their star the, so the temperature is is exactly right for liquid water to exist not ice or 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 gas why liquid water because it has these wonderful properties it's it it pulls it sticks molecules together so sure you know we could be more imaginative and there are many uh, science fiction stories for example where many authors have explored more exotic uh, possibilities so i don't think scientists are saying this is the only way life could possibly uh, appear elsewhere it's just that it's the most probable way it's it's the easiest way So why would life find a more difficult way if there's an easier way to do it? If life could exist more in a more difficult environment, then it should also exist in more uh favorable environments as well. I was talking a few years ago with a member of the Cassini mission and he was excited about the new discoveries of Enceladus for example. Mm. And he was uh, he was saying that he started to eat right and take care of himself because he really wanted to live to get the announcement of life in uh, our solar system. What? Uh, how are you betting on this? That that is a good question. I mean, I I think if I'm going to bet on it, I would probably say that we are reasonably likely. to find evidence of of life under the ice of moons like Enceladus or 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 Europa possibly even on the moon Titan um it's not going to be very exciting life it'll be single cell you know sort of very microscopic life forms but for scientists that's that's enough you know we don't need aliens with civilizations and spaceships uh, that we have to fight against like in the movies it will be enough to know that life is possible uh, elsewhere so i think yeah i think that, that there is a good chance there's a strong chance that in our lifetime we will find evidence of of either life existing now 
uh, say in, in in the liquid oceans under the, the the ice surface of some of these moons of Saturn and Jupiter, or potentially evidence of past life that existed, for example, on Mars when Mars was a much more friendly place for life to exist on, unlike the way it is today. Would it be ironic to find out that the Martians actually existed at life on Mars, which is probably the, the quintessential sci-fi trope mm. is uh, based on fact? Absolutely. And, and I think, you know, a lot of the scientists who are working on many of the missions to Mars, to, you know, sending robotic probes that are going to dig under the surface, uh, you know, where there may be potentially still some evidence of micro life that hasn't been destroyed by, by radiation. I think they're, they're, I wouldn't say confident, but they're enthusiastic about the possibility. Yes, I mean, we, we, we talk about life on Mars because it's the closest planet to us. It's almost the same size as Earth. As you say, it's the quintessential home of, of aliens. Uh, it would be nice. It may, it may, I mean, who knows? It may even be, there, there are, there are um, scientists who, who, who have suggested this, that life began on Mars first and that life on Earth was seeded by Mars which was, would be interesting. Of course, it still then asks the question, how did life begin on Mars? So that doesn't explain the origin of life, but it just pushes it one step back. But who knows? The recent uh, news that there are phosphines on Venus and then people saying, oh, that means there is life. And then scientists coming and saying, well, not really. How does that affect the trust people have in science? You know saying something and then taking it back and getting mm. all enthusiastic about possible possibly finding life on venus and then saying well not really mm. it, it i think that is a problem with with how scientists communicate um you know scientists are human they want to 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 uh people to listen to them they when they're excited about a discovery they want to announce it to the world and very often they don't quite appreciate that wider society doesn't think the way scientists think. You know that you know the, the, I, For me, the most it's more important to communicate the scientific method than it is to communicate the findings of science. You know, how do we arrive at our conclusions? What is a good scientific theory? Why are we never certain? You know, why is uncertainty and doubt so important in science? And we're seeing that, you know, we're seeing that happening now around the world with, with the coronavirus. You know, scientists are saying, look, we don't know. Or they will say something one day and then the next week they will say, no, no, we have, we have new data. Now we think this. And of course, the public then says, no, you, you, but you said something else last week. Why do you change your minds? Maybe you don't know anything and, and they lose trust uh, in science. So I think it's the scientist's responsibility to say, this is how science works. We're never certain. We might say something, we might get very excited <laughs> about a discovery, and then, and then, but then we have to put in the caveats and conditions. Look, let, you know, what does this mean? We can't be so sure. But I don't blame the public for being excited. It is an exciting finding. It's true, but maybe it's also uh, part of how we teach science and not only science, because in school, it's very important to have it right. So yeah, students are being penalized if they don't say the right thing, that they mm -hmm. don't tell the right answer to the teacher. And then we come back and say, you know what? OK, the teachers want you to be right, but then the scientists, they are allowed not to be right. But yeah, I... I, I've, I've told this story uh, before. Um, I, I was making a, a documentary for the BBC um, uh, television uh, called Gravity. And uh, I, I was talking about Earth's gravity and Einstein's theory and how gravity makes time run more slowly. You know, it's a fascinating you know, subject, Einstein's theory of relativity. I had finished filming um, uh, the, the, it's a one and a half hour documentary uh, and it'd been edited and I just had to go to the studio to record the commentary, the voiceover. And then with my producer, we discovered that we, I, had made a mistake in one of my explanations. 
I was talking about, you know, if you put a clock on the North Pole and you put a clock on the equator, which one runs faster, you know, for, for different reasons in, in, in physics. And I had given the wrong explanation because I hadn't quite understood a, a, a subtle um, um, detail in relativity theory. So we told the BBC, um, uh, the people at the BBC, you know, who were going to show the program, it was going to be shown maybe in a few weeks after that. And we said, no, you have to stop. Uh, there's a mistake. We have to shoot something again. And they said, oh, no, no, look, just film the, the bit where the mistake again, and 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 we'll 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 just add that little bit, and then nobody will know, and and he'll be fine. But I said this is actually I know why I said, obviously I was a little bit maybe crazy to say this, but I said this is a very good opportunity to explain how science works. That I admit that I made a mistake, I was wrong, and that's okay. It's okay to be wrong in science. And they said, oh no, Jim, you know we're we're worried about your you are a professor of physics, you know, we don't want people to, we don't want to be embarrassed. <laughs> by, and I said, no, it's fine. This is how science works. And I, you know, I did. And so in the, in the film, I say about maybe three quarters of the way through, I say, unfortunately, at this point, I realized I had made a mistake because I didn't stand the equations of relativity. In fact, this is correct. And that was wrong. And I explained the correction. And people were saying, oh, you're very brave to, to admit your mistake. But I said, no, this is, this is, if I was a politician, okay, <laughs> you can say, because politicians never say they're wrong. They will never admit that they, they make mistakes. But in science, we make mistakes all the time. And, and that's how we learn. So you're absolutely right, Ada, that in school, we teach school children to always have the correct answer. But actually, when we're trying to learn about, about the world and how it works, we, we make mistakes and that's part of the progress of science. If we didn't make mistakes, we wouldn't learn anything new. When people, when scientists say we don't know this, I think many of them uh, need also to tell the public we don't know this yet. I want to take this discussion towards the power of yet. Uh, we are very young, let's say, in our search for uh, life extraterrestrial life yeah. what do you think development makes you excited um absolutely i mean i think that the the the, the idea that we don't know doesn't mean we will always not know and we and, and we are making progress for me i think certainly in terms of the the, the search for life beyond earth there are, of course, the missions to to uh, um, to Mars, and one maybe in a few years, missions, more careful missions to land on some of the moons of the gas giants, Saturn and, and Jupiter, and study where there's life underneath. But but there's also the the possibility of looking for life beyond our solar system uh, on on ex exoplanets, planets that orbit around other star systems. Um, you know, we know these planets exist. We, 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 have, we, have, we, we know that most stars now don't live in isolation. They have planets orbiting around them. And we know some of those planets are, are solid, rocky planets. Some of them have the right gravity, you know, the right mass. They may have liquid water. That doesn't tell us just because they have the conditions for life. That doesn't tell us that life did emerge there because it might be life is very special. So I think for me, one of the most exciting developments in the coming years is the launch of the James Webb telescope. This is the telescope that will um, essentially replace the Hubble telescope. Famously, if you, if you want very detailed pictures of, of the universe, you need to get outside of the Earth's atmosphere because then there's no distortion of the light coming through the atmosphere. So you need to have telescopes in space in orbit. The James Webb Telescope, we hope, will be able to detect some of the chemical signatures of life elsewhere. And one of the, uh, the, the chapters in the, in the book uh, talks about this. For example, evidence that maybe uh, photosynthesis is taking place on another planet, because that would lead to uh, uh, um, some some uh, special properties of, of of light that we would get. 
So all we can do when we look at those planets, they're too far to visit, but we can study the light coming from them. And that light, the different colors, the spectrum uh, uh, of that light may contain within it some evidence that photosynthesis is taking place on these planets. And photosynthesis is, is such a clever idea. It's, it's so important for life, bacteria and of course plants, that again, we think, you know, if life were to emerge, surely it would make use of some of these clever techniques like photosynthesis. Now, maybe it can do something very different, but finding evidence of photosynthesis would be a tremendous step towards verifying life elsewhere. So I'm just, I'm waiting, fingers crossed for the James Webb telescope because it's been delayed for years and years. Finally, when it launches, is it I did next year or the year after, we can start getting some results. When we are looking for, for extraterrestrial life, we are basically focusing on different parts of the universe. And there is a risk that the moment we are focusing is not happening anything. The moment we change our perspective, something happens. So the fact that we haven't found yet signs of extraterrestrial life, is it a problem of not being any, of not being able to cover enough space? Space is too big or time is too big? Is it a problem of space or time? Because they I, might have happened yeah. millions of years ago. Absolutely. No, it's, it's both. It's absolutely both. You know, the universe is very big and, and, and we have had many billions of years since the Big Bang. You're quite right. What we're looking at is one particular corner of the universe, of our galaxy, in fact, at a particular time, the time when the light left those, those stars. And in fact, we're only looking in our neighborhood because we can't see beyond, you know, details of and it's beyond uh, stars of more than, you know, say 100 light years or so uh, away. Um, and so we're only looking at life that exists now in our neighborhood of our galaxy. That's a very, very tiny fraction of the whole universe and across all time. So it doesn't tell us that there's no life elsewhere, of course. And, and I think most scientists that you, you would ask would say, Maybe we will never find evidence of life elsewhere, but I find it very hard to believe that life doesn't exist or didn't exist somewhere else in the universe, just because of the sheer vastness of the universe. It, it, it's, it seems inconceivable to me that we can be so special, so unique, that this is the only place in the universe where there's life. It seems crazy, but that doesn't mean, of course, just because we think life exists elsewhere doesn't mean that necessarily we have been visited by aliens who, you know, built the pyramids and, and uh, uh, examined yeah, some cows. Yeah. yeah, exactly. That's right. <laughs> that's that's a that's a much further step. <laughs> yes, our the, the future readers of this book will also find that we are not domestic, uh, we are not eatable. Yeah, that, that you see, um, Hollywood movies forget that, you know, that alien life is not likely to be anything like having the same molecular structure as us. You know, they may, if there's alien life there, multicellular, it may have DNA, but maybe it has, it's found another way of storing the instruction manual for life. It may be some other kind of molecular structure. But even if they found something like DNA, you know, there's there's food on earth that we can't eat because we can't digest it can you imagine aliens being able to digest humans so yeah we we, we talk about that if aliens visit us they they probably won't like our taste they won't like to eat us which so, so that's good they may want to destroy us of course but <laughs> but if you are where to put numbers you'd i understand from what you say that you believe that probably there is life in the universe. It's very unlikely not to be. How about intelligent life? Because, okay, if the chance is almost 100%, let's say, or close, it's a big chance that there is life. How much smaller is the chance that there is or there was intelligent life? Intelligent, and how do we define that? Well, <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, well, I mean, I think the, the, the big jump is from uh 
simple single cell organisms like you know bacteria for example um and multicellular life and i think many many scientists and i think some discuss this in the book will say that is the jump that makes us more special you know there may be a the universe could be full of life but it's all very boring microbial life the really interesting thing is how rare or how how likely was it that multicellular life started on earth i think once you get multicellular life and and darwinian evolution will happen everywhere in the universe because that's not a that's not unique to to life on earth that's that's just logic that survival of the fittest and evolving and improving all the time with every generation so i think once multicellular life exists in a sense it's inevitable that that will develop and advance and become more sophisticated and evolve intelligence now that intelligence doesn't necessarily mean thinking the way humans think but certainly intelligence to 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 contemplate and to you know theory of mind and you know uh, to to build civilizations that that's that's certainly possible so i think the difficult step which of course we don't know the answer to we don't know how 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 uh, difficult it was how rare an event it was for the first single cell organism to eat a cell and then they live in symbiosis and and evolve and multiply into a multicellular organism that may have only happened once in the universe here on earth that that's the question we 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 still don't know so maybe we're rare not because we're the only life maybe we're we're alone because we're the only complex life because that that happened once here again i hope that's not not the case but hoping and believing is not science. <laughs> I'm a huge fan of one of your contributors, actually several, but uh, Martin Rees has a extraordinary essay and he talks about the likelihood that alien life is robotic life and we can also see it in our future. Uh yes, I mean Martin Rees who who is one of the most uh, respected scientist astronomers in the world um and has clearly thought about this very deeply um he's right you know we are we are, if we think about civilization here on earth and and where we are uh, as a, as a as a species in developing our own technologies we are on the verge of developing artificial intelligence that is becoming more and more able to to do the tasks and start to think the way humans think you know we're not that far away you know maybe this century uh, uh, of developing artificial intelligence that we we would call artificial general intelligence so absolutely intelligent enough to think to contemplate to imagine in in as sophisticated a way as humans can as intelligent as humans not thinking like humans we're not replicating humans but but you know already we're seeing ai machine learning that is able to uh, uh, uh come up with ideas you know and 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 imagination that that we don't even understand how it arrived at so i think we will be able to develop ais uh, and and combine that with 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 robotics um it may be that at some point you know centuries from now they will replace us or they will merge with us so you know we, you know human consciousness will be transplanted into a, into a machine or will be no distinction between humans and machines uh, and and that's only you know uh, of the order of maybe centuries on earth and a century a hundred years is nothing compared with the age of the universe and so if we think there may be alien civilization somewhere else in the universe the probability that they emerged and evolved at exactly the same time as us it is very low it's much more likely that they existed long before us or they will exist much later in 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 the future if they've existed before us and they've evolved then of course there's a very strong possibility they've evolved beyond anything that we can imagine in terms of biological bodies they may have evolved to a point where they don't need these uh 
expendable, you know, sort of uh, 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 quite fragile cellular biochemical systems, uh, and 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 life is much more prevalent in you know, within some sort of advanced technology. So yeah, in, if if we're talking about laws of probability, what is the chance that life will exist in a certain form? I think Martin Rees is very very correct that there's a very strong chance that life elsewhere doesn't exist as biochemistry it it exists as 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 technology as 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 artificial intelligence on the other hand uh, in the book uh, the octopus is uh, offered as an alternative way of looking at intelligence because it also depends on how we define our terms um, do you think that there is there are other forms of intelligent life on earth that you, we are not aware of? Um, well, certainly we, we, we are learning more about other species that are more intelligent than we thought. Uh, I mean, we know of other mammals, you know, the other uh, higher mammals like, like the great apes, um, dogs, elephants, dolphins, whales. Um, and and um, um, things like um, you know octopuses and, and squids. Uh, uh, the, what we're learning is that they're intelligent in a very different way from us. You know, we shouldn't you know, what we the word in English anthropomorphize. You know, we shouldn't project the way we think and our intelligence on on other species. And actually, the the example you mentioned in the book about the octopus. This is um, uh, Anil Seth who, who who studies consciousness. And he argues that we don't need to look for alien life on Mars or distant planets. We have the equivalent of alien life here on Earth. The octopus has an intelligence that is very, very different. The way its brain works, the way its consciousness works is very different from, from humans. And I think this was explored in a great Hollywood movie, um, Arrival, uh, where the aliens that visit us look like an octopus. They don't look like humans with two arms and two legs. They don't look, don't look like E.T., uh, so that's possible. I don't think there are other in, um, higher intelligence species on Earth that we haven't discovered, because if they were intelligent enough, they would have made themselves known. There would be evidence what they would have created in that sense. You know, I don't think there's anything beyond the, 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 the higher mammals, for example, in terms of intelligence that we know of already. As a physicist, I must ask you now to speculate on future technologies because uh, we must be looking for civilizations that are more advanced than us. As you said, it's very unlikely to, to be equals. Uh, what, what's the future for communication technology? Well, the, the one thing we, we are quite confident about is that we understand enough about the laws of physics that we know what are the most obvious ways of communicating. For example, Einstein's relativity tells us that nothing can travel faster than light. This isn't that we are still not clever enough to have discovered something faster than light. We understand enough about the laws of physics that we know why nothing can travel faster than light in our universe. It's just impossible. If something could travel faster than light, then that leads to paradoxes and all the technology we have today would just not exist. You know, so, so we understand that communicating with aliens, even if they're much more advanced technologically than us, would still require some form of information exchange. And that information exchange can only happen at the speed of light, whether it's electromagnetic communications, whether it's gravitational waves, even, you know, we're, we're starting to learn a bit about gravitational waves, for example. Maybe in a hundred years, we will find that's another form of uh, learning or exchanging information with the universe. Um, so, the, the way is this and, and also for example the you know the, the laws of physics and 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 the mathematical rules you know we we calculate on earth uh, the the circumference of a circle divided by its diameter is 3.14159265 etc you know pi um that will be the same in an in a, on an alien world 
they will also have, they may not have the decimal system, but they will still have that number in some other base, maybe, depending on how many fingers they have. Um, and so there, there is a common language that we could use to communicate with aliens, uh, and that is the language of, of, of the laws of nature the language of mathematics and science, which will be the same everywhere. The technology that we use, which I think, coming back to your, 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 your question, yeah, there are certainly, I'm sure, going to be more sophisticated ways of communicating. And some of the technologies we're developing in the 21st century, I think, are very exciting. You know, you, uh, we, we, we touched on, on um, uh, artificial intelligence, but there are other exciting developments, like whether we can build a quantum computer. There are many technologies based on quantum physics, which are very exciting, uh, which rely on the, some of the stranger properties of the quantum world, the world of, of, of atoms and the particles that make up atoms. And these are technologies that, that are still, we still haven't solved many of the problems. I'm not saying we have a quantum computer it'll be much easier to talk to aliens. Uh, but, but that's an example of some of the technologies that we are developing. Certainly, for example, artificial intelligence. One would imagine that uh, once we have really, uh, you know, artificial general intelligence that could be placed within a probe, we don't, humans don't need to travel to, to our neighboring star systems. We can send AI there. They don't have to be robots with arms, but you know there can be an intelligence that can probe, communicate, can tell them about Earth, and then can send back the information to us. So I think there's lots of exciting possibilities. We don't have to travel ourselves uh, to visit different worlds. There is a word and I, uh, uh, saying, and I don't remember right now who said it, that every advanced science is not really discernible from um from magic. magic yes yeah how how do we know that some of these things are actually possible versus or probable you know likely from a scientific point of view versus things that are completely um fictional interesting ideas but with no no connection with reality how do we know when something is a uh, scientific speculation versus um, conspiracy theory? Well, certainly yeah, one of the things we learn in science is that we can never be 100% confident when we, when we make a statement. If, if, you know, if we, we should never say that is impossible, you know, that, that that's, uh, we will never understand this or we will no, never know the answer to that because you know, if 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 I were to take my 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 mm -hmm. um, my iPhone and uh, take it back to a hundred years ago, or even fifty years ago, and say, "Look, this is a you know you you know maybe when 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 the original Star Trek was first shown in the late sixties, you know, and they they have their you know speakers, and and we say, yes, uh, by the twenty first century, early twenty first century, everybody will be carrying a supercomputer in their pockets, and it can do this and this and this and this and this. That, as you say, that will be no different from magic. Um, so we can never predict what new technologies, what advance in our understanding we're going to have uh, in the future, because there will always be surprises. And, and that's a good thing. You know, it's great that there are always surprises. Life would be very boring if we could predict exactly how the future would evolve. However, what we can talk about and what we specul about, uh, speculate about has to be built upon the, the knowledge we are confident about now, the facts that we have learnt about the world that we know are true. I, I always use an example. People say, how do you know, you know, some, nothing can be certain in science. I will say, uh, if I take a ball and drop it from a height of five meters to the ground, I know it will hit the ground after one second. Not half a second, not two seconds, not three seconds, one second. It's true now, it was true a thousand years ago, it'll be true in a thousand years in the future. On Earth, you know, Earth's gravity. And, and Galileo taught us this half a millennium ago. That is a fact. That's not something that 
somebody else is going to discover. I have just discovered my new theory predicts that ball will take three seconds to hit the ground. No, it's going to take one second. If your theory predicts three seconds, your theory is wrong. So we build our knowledge on what we already know, but that doesn't stop us from speculating. So I think for me, the very good science fiction is the science fiction that creates an imagined world that is still possible within what we currently understand in science. And imagine technologies, as long as they don't break the laws of physics, then I'm happy. <laughs> you also wrote uh, a science fiction book, Leo, Sanford. Uh, it's, a, it's a great attraction for scientists to speculate. How pleasurable was to try? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. See, I didn't mention that I'd written a science fiction book. I didn't want to, to you know, I wanted to, to, be, to remain modest, but, but thank you for mentioning. <laughs> it, it, was, it was a real um, adventure. Uh, it, I mean, I, I had written many popular science books, so nonfiction, but to write a science fiction thriller was very different, a very new experience. I didn't realize how difficult it would be to write fiction. It's very different from nonfiction. I thought, well, you know, you just imagine a world uh, and, you know, and then this. And you know, I, I remember when my children were young and I would, in bed, I would just tell them stories. I would just make up some, 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 some stories. And ah, that's easy. But the craft of writing fiction is very, very different. So it was a very um, a steep learning curve for me. But on the other hand, yeah, it was a great, pleasure to be freed from the constraints of hard science. I still had to build my story around what is possible, but, but, but as long as it was possible, as long as it didn't break the laws of physics, then it was okay. And it's very different from writing nonfiction. So I was talking about dark matter, end of the world and quantum entanglement, all the stuff that may or may not be true, but as long as it's possible, it's a lot. <laughs> uh, a lot of sci-fi authors um, are in fact fascinated by science and probably they use their fiction to explore possibilities. Mm. Uh, and a lot of dystopias are in fact thought experiments about how the world can take a turn for the worse. Yeah. And um, the whole extraterrestrial life has been a battleground um, during the Cold War, for example. Um, it, the Cold War influenced the way we, we thought about aliens and extraterrestrial life and, and exploring the, the, the universe. How does that perception, the popular perception of extraterrestrial life influences our lives today? in your I, it's it's very interesting actually to 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 trace back how we perceive um alien life one of the chapters in in the book um uh written by uh, dallas campbell who's a, a good friend of mine he's he's not a scientist uh he he in fact he began life as an actor and a tv presenter but he's fascinated by science and he's become part of our um circle of science communicators and he in his chapter, he talks about how, why do we think aliens come in flying saucers? You know, the, the circular shape thing, because the original, you know, the pilot in after the Second World War, who, who claimed to have seen something before him, nobody had seen flying saucers. As soon as he says, I saw something that looks like a flying saucer, everybody is seeing flying saucers. Then when, you know, Hollywood makes movies about aliens, that changes how we imagine what they look like. And so it's very, because you know, what, what I'm arguing is of, course, is, of course, we haven't encountered aliens visiting Earth yet, despite what many people will, will argue and, and believe, the way we perceive them and their intentions is culture dependent. It depends on it's imagination. And so it's whether it's science fiction authors, whether it's Hollywood uh, directors, you know, what you see on TV, that that feeds into our imagination. And that's how we then imagine must look like. 
we don't realize we have created them. We have created them usually in our image. Uh, they look like us, but slightly different so that they, we can say they come from another planet. You were talking about sending probes and robots to, to other stars, but that sounds great, but also a little sad for us humans because we are explorers. We want to go there because we want to go there. <laughs> what, uh, what technology, and this is a question from, uh, from the audience, uh, what particular technology is most probable to enable us, our fragile bodies, to go to other stars? Um, yes, I mean, you're absolutely right. It's, it is a, a, it's a shame if we are trapped on this planet and, and we just ask the AIs and the robots to go and explore and come back and tell us what they found. It's like, you know, you, you can't go on holiday because of, the, because of COVID, but, you know, you can, uh, <laughs> somebody can send you pictures <laughs> or just look at it on, on, on the internet. It's not the same thing. I mean, again, um, science fiction writers and, and, and uh, filmmakers have explored various possibilities of how humans could travel. The usual way is to put humans in suspended animation. You know, you freeze us down to sort of uh, near absolute zero where the bodily functions slow right down almost to, to stopping. You're not dead, but you're, you're, you're suspended life. And then, you know, the, the, your, your spacecraft wakes you up when there's something interesting, maybe in a hundred years. You know, that's a possibility. But also I think probably in the longer term, it won't be our biological bodies that travel. We will travel, our consciousness will travel, but our consciousness will be, uh, would be explored by proxy, by uh, a robot or, or you know, uh, you know you, I'm not talking about taking your brain and putting it inside a machine, but essentially that's the idea that we are, what defines us as humans is our consciousness, is our intelligence. It's not our arms and legs. Uh, uh, and so we don't, you know, our bodies are, in a sense, not so important. They don't have to come with us, where us means our consciousness. So maybe just our consciousness, our, our minds can travel in some form of technological vehicle. Where does our consciousness come from? I know it's probably too short a meeting to cover that. <laughs> What's your take on that? Um, consciousness for me uh, evolves uh, and, it, and uh, you know, there isn't, it's not a light, it's not on or off. Uh, it's like a light on a dimmer switch. It can be very dim, it can be very bright. Um, we would argue we are conscious, but it's not different from the processes that go on inside our brain. It, it's not that, you know, we have a biological uh, a, a gray matter inside our heads and then there's some magic dust you sprinkle on and suddenly we are awake. Um, it's been discussed by for, uh, and theologians and scientists for many, many years. You know, the mind-body problem, the body, do we have a soul? You know, I'm, I'm not a religious person. I don't believe in the existence of a soul because for me that doesn't fit with the laws of the universe as I understand them. It's outside of science. Uh, so, so it doesn't have a connection. But, um, you know, a dog is conscious. The cat is conscious. Is a mouse conscious? Yeah, not so much. Uh, you know, so I think consciousness and intelligence and complexity of the, 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 the uh, thoughts and neuronal activity in the brain is a gradual process. So I think consciousness gradually evolved in the same way that uh, other aspects of evolution improved in life over the last few billion years. I wanted to say that your uh, this book that you edited is actually a book of questions. You get more questions than you get <laughs> that's science. <laughs> exactly. Uh, I wanted to, to emphasize that uh, the the power and the ability to to make and to formulate better questions it's actually an advancement of science. Yes, and 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 in fact, something that I've argued for, which is uh, different from some of my other colleagues, particularly in theoretical physics, which is that philosophy is important. Uh, many, many physicists, I mean, Stephen Hawking is a good example, you know, the, the, uh, you know who, who, who said this, uh, that 
physicists don't need philosophers anymore. You know, we are now, uh, you know, producing the knowledge that is required. Philosophers, they just sit there and they just think, you know, the same old stuff and argue about the same old stuff. We don't need them. But actually, if you think about the, the great physicists of, of uh, uh, you know, 100 years ago, the founders of quantum mechanics, you know, Niels Bohr and Einstein and, and, and Schrodinger. Yeah, these guys knew philosophy. They were, they were very well informed about how to think philosophically. And philosophy gives us a way of thinking that gives us clarity. And I think that's, you know, when you talk about the questions that we ask, scientists are good at finding answers. Philosophers are good at asking the right questions. So I think there should be much more collaboration between science and philosophy because they can help us find the clearest questions to ask because those are the ones that I think will lead to interesting answers. Before we go a little bit deeper probably into that because it's such a fascinating subject for all of us here and probably from some people who are listening to us, I have a much more um, a question anchored more into now. Um, the book has a whole chapter on people who believe in conspiracy theories about alien life, Area 51 and so on. Mm. Do you think there is a likelihood that people who believe conspiracy theories about aliens are also more likely to believe that, I don't know, the COVID is a conspiracy as well? And is there a danger what, about that? There is, and this is something that is, is or should be of concern to society. I think if someone believes that, you know, uh, the US government is hiding um, aliens or the aliens have built the pyramids or the earth is flat, you know, some of those ideas that for, for, for scientists who understand the, the, the rational arguments and the logic and the evidence against some of these ideas, that's fine. You know, if you want to believe the earth is flat, you're wrong, but hey, you know, you can believe what you want. That's, that's fine. But absolutely, there does seem to be a correlation. You know, people who are uh, suspicious of authority, who feel maybe disenfranchised, disengaged, they, they don't have, they're not empowered. They believe that, that there are secrets being hidden by higher organizations, governments, other bodies, you know, con uh, the, the, what conspiracies think, uh, think about, they are also more likely to, to believe in other more dangerous conspiracies. You know, if you think we never went to the moon, and you can think we never went to the moon, we did, right? But, you know, if you want to believe that, fine. But if you also then, and there's a good chance you might think that vaccines are dangerous or that the covid uh, uh, the coronavirus is is how was created by 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 China or in China they think it was created by America uh, as as a bioweapon or that it's produced by you know five G masts or something like that then that is dangerous that is no longer amusing as no, it's no longer something that we ha we can remain silent about then the next question is 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 how do you tackle it. A conspiracy theorist, by definition, is not going to be persuaded by evidence. You can try. I mean, it's possible. You know, not every conspiracy conspiracy theorists are not crazy people. You know, they're they're normal, intelligent people uh, who have have um, followed something maybe on YouTube, some conspiracy that has some origin of truth, but built around it has become something wild. But once you're captured by that belief it then becomes magnified. Uh, and, and we all know psychologists understand this very well, the idea of confirmation bias uh, and echo chambers, and you only listen to the people you agree with. So you can, that belief can build up and can be very, very difficult to, to, to move. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the things I, I say is I would ask a conspiracy, you know, what is the difference between, say, a conspiracy theory and a, a scientific theory? Ask a conspiracy theorist, what evidence would you need to change your mind, to convince you that you are wrong? Nothing. They will say, no evidence you can give me will change my mind. That's when I know they are not arguing from a rational scientific perspective. 
that's how conspiracy theories are different from scientific theories. So it's very difficult. I mean, a lot of people who know much more about this subject than me, social psychologists, are discussing I mean, how to tackle conspiracy theories because it's so important now, particularly with the with the with the pandemic. Uh, but you know, also with all the you know the fake news and and and. Um, without getting too political, the followers of Donald Trump, uh, you know, and, and misinformation online and the polarization of opinions on social media. It, it's becoming a real, a really important social problem. So we can no longer sit back and laugh at the, 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 the friend who, who tells you that he believes he saw an alien yesterday. You know, it's, uh, it's becoming more serious. Believing in a conspiracy, I think, also implies some arrogance that you really understand the subject. And uh, as this book, your book, also demonstrates, all the questions are really hard. For example, how to, how did life come from unorganic to organic? Mm, mm. And, uh, I wanted to go um, to um, something that is often heard in media. Don't don't uh, write about complicated stuff or keep it simple, which I think is a mistake that uh, people are, aren't interested or don't have the capability of uh, uh, reading uh, science. Yeah, I think uh, again, you know, part partly because of the internet and social media, uh, we are bombarded with so much information. Uh, and it's changing all the time that our attention span is getting shorter on any one subject. So we, 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 we don't put in the effort to dig underneath the surface beyond the superficial. We want headlines. We want sound bites. We want quick, t tight stories. And then we move on to something else. But you're right. You know, one of the things we, you know, although as a science communicator, I try and, and explain complicated concepts as simply as possible, that doesn't mean that all these concepts are actually simple. That an expert in a field is somebody has, who has spent their life studying this subject. My, um, my radio program on, on BBC Radio 4, The Life Scientific, I interview um, other scientists. And I remember some years ago, I interviewed Peter Higgs, you know, the Higgs boson man. And, and I asked him, I said, uh, can you explain what is the Higgs boson? in 30 seconds? And he said, no, I can't. I said, okay, can you explain it in one minute? And he said, not really. Uh, and, and I was thinking, ah, oh, this is terrible. You know, this is not going to be a very good program. <laughs> but then he said something very remarkable. He said, Look, I've, I spent 50 years, almost all my career trying to understand this concept. And it's difficult, quantum field theory and the standard model of particle physics. He said, it's difficult. What right does anybody have in expecting to be able to understand it in 30 seconds or one minute? You know, it, it is difficult. And we should, you're right, we, we, we should also stress that some of these concepts are difficult. That's why we need experts. That's why we should value evidence and expertise over opinion. Uh, you know, when someone on, on social media says, you know, Yes, well, you know, you, you you talk about quantum physics, but you know, my opinion, my view is as valid as yours. Uh, but it takes time and effort and dedication to learn about a subject, and most things are more complicated than the superficial, and we, and we, we have to accept that. Which uh, allows me to uh, go into the probably last question that we will be able to ask. You wrote a book that uh, was published this year and that's going to appear at Humanitas as well, which is The World According to Physics, which is a book that popularizes or brings the physics closer to, to the public. What made you want to write your own book about physics? Well, I mean, I, I had written books about quantum mechanics, about relativity, about astronomy, about the history of science. Um, what I wanted to do was on, on uh, two reasons, I guess. One reason was this book was to, to really tell the world about my love affair with, 
with my passion for the subject that I have studied all my life. You know, I often say, why isn't everybody in love with physics like me? You know, how can you not, you know, find this is this is the subject gives you answers to, you know, does does the universe go on forever? What is the nature of time? What does the inside of a black hole look like? What is an atom made of? These questions are every child is is curious about. Um, so I wanted to get across my love of, of the subject, but also what do we currently understand about physics? Here we are in 2020. What is our the limit of our understanding? So there are many books on popular science, particularly, you know, on, on physics and astronomy and chemistry and biology, where I, I talk about our our knowledge of a subject is like an island. Uh, and that island is finite in size. Beyond it is the oceans of the unknown. So as we our knowledge grows, the island grows in size. And there are many books which are exploring the island, you know, the mountains and the trees and the forests and things. So, you know, how we know what we know. How, how do we learn about everything in physics going back to the ancient Greeks? This book, The World According to Physics, is an exploration of the, of the shoreline of the island. The, the edge, the boundary of what we know, what we know now, how do we know it, and what is there beyond? You know, if, we, if you walk out into the water a little bit and explore, you know, pull your trousers up a little bit and explore the water, what are the mysteries out there that we still need to understand? We know they're mysteries, you know, dark matter, dark energy, was there something before the Big Bang? Questions that we're still trying to answer that we want we hope one day to include so it's it's a small book but it's a book trying to get the average person who has no background in physics infect them with the enthusiasm for the subject and bring them up to date i guess thank you very much vasile do you have any more questions because i think we need to wrap up i have several but uh, maybe for another time <laughs> next Thank time for the launch of the next book absolutely invite me back <laughs> we will definitely will thank you very much Dim Alkalili uh, your book is now available in Romania your book about the extraterrestrial lives uh, look Basile has it um, uh, and thank you very much for talking to us and sharing part of our knowledge and worldview with uh, our viewers Thank, you, Thank very you very much for having me. I've, I've really enjoyed it. Invite me back again.